Hello, welcome to Russian History of Russia. In this episode, Vladimir I shopping through world religions like Goldilocks through the Bear's Porch, his fratricide, his sex slaves, and of course, his righteous path to sanctity. It's big, it's cold, it's full of gas and gold. It's 1200 years old, but still never does it toll. We're Christians, but not really Europeans, but from Asia. We send the dogs to space and kill the Tsars on occasion. We drink sodas made from bread, eat our enemies in Kasha. And that's why it's so fun to study history of Russia. We've previously covered the first century of Kievan Rus, and ended in 972 with Svetoslav's death, who did more fighting and less ruling. He died in a fight as well, of course. So there's no wonder that his sons did the same for a bit, only instead of conquering semi-hostile neighbors, they fought each other. The father of the year, Svetoslav, had three sons, all from different mothers. The oldest, Yarpolk, ruled Kiev. Oleg was sent to the Drivelands land. You remember the Drivelands, right? Those guys just couldn't get a break. And the youngest, Vladimir, was sent to Novgorod. Already in 977, Yaropolk attacked Oleg, and he supposedly accidentally died trying to escape and taking a leap of faith from the bridge. So Vladimir hears about this and wisely goes on vacation overseas to the Varangian lands. He returns rested, tanned, and with a Viking army he recruited. He learns that the ruler of city of Polotsk, located halfway to Kiev, not only hit it off with Yaropolk, but his daughter, Rogneta, is to marry the Kievan prince. So, opera twist, Vladimir had proposed to her first, but he was turned down and humiliated as a son of a slave woman since his mother was Svetoslav's concubine. As pagans, Slavs were polygamous, so princes and other nobles had concubines, which is just a fancy talk for sex slaves, as well as multiple wives. Here, the soap opera takes an even more serious R-rating turn. Vladimir pays Polotsk a classic gangster-style visit. He rapes Rogneta in front of her father and brothers, then murders them and marries her. They had several children, although she did attempt to kill him a few years later. So Vladimir and his forces are marching on Kiev, but instead of trying to take the city, he bribes one of Yaropolk's noblemen to convince the Kievan prince that there is an uprising brewing in Kiev, so he escapes the safety of his capital. Vladimir then arranges the meeting where he orders to kill his half-brother. He also, of course, continues his proud feminist tradition and makes Yaropolk's pregnant wife either his wife or a concubine. As for the Vikings, he recruited, he had promised them tributes from the Kievans, then said they totally misunderstood him and what he actually meant was that few of them are staying here in Kiev and serving him, the rest can go to Greece and serve the emperor and nobody's getting Kievan tributes. Cool, cool. And that is how the rule of Vladimir, the baptizer of Rus, had started in 980. The primary chronicle, the main source in Vladimir here, while attributing this really big role to him, had a lot of nasty stuff to say about him at the same time. He is portrayed as a cruel and cunning ruler motivated by lust and petty to his enemies, at least before the conversion. For example, there is evidence that Yaropolk was already dabbling in Christianity before that. There might have even been a church in Kiev. But Vladimir coming to power actually started a pagan reaction. He reformed the pantheon, built monuments to pagan gods, and some of the first Kievan Christians were murdered. It is worth noting, though, that this reform was already a small step towards monotheism on his part. The thunder gods Perun's place in that pantheon was not one of an equal, but of the most powerful boss god. There are, however, at least two ways to look at this. Yes, there is a chance that Vladimir was just a big of a jerk as described. Then again, people in the medieval Europe were generally not very nice at the time. But it can also be attributed to the author's wish to show the contrast of his sinful ways before the conversion. He's even compared to King Solomon. So let's dive a little bit into the legend of how Rus and Russia got to be Christian, but not in an obvious way. Before Vladimir, Rus had visits from Christian missionaries from both Greek and Roman churches, as well as some instances of conversion such as Princess Olga. She very possibly saw the value that monotheistic religion provided to centralized power, as well as all the opportunities that came with a cultural and political link to more powerful neighbors. However, to understand why Russian Christianity is different from the rest of Europe, we have to understand all the holy mess between the Holy Roman Empire and the East Roman Empire. While it's pretty common to talk about the end of the Roman Empire with the fall of the rule of Rome in 400, among the people who then lived in modern-day Greece, Turkey, Balkans, and other Mediterranean territories, it would have raised a lot of eyebrows, especially in today's Istanbul, then known as Constantinople. As the western half of empire indeed fell apart and was subsequently replaced by the medieval western and central European states, Roman culture and rule continued to live through the Eastern Roman Empire. In fact, Byzantine, what we will start calling it later, was the longest-lived empire in history, thriving for another thousand years after the fall of its western sister. 
But even without that kind of Rome, Pope's power only kept growing. Religious differences between Constantinople and Rome were brewing for centuries, and especially soured when in the year 800 the Pope had the audacity of crowning Frank King Charlemagne the Emperor of Holy Roman Empire, the title that hadn't existed for almost four centuries with the Byzantine Emperor kind of assuming the role. The two branches were also growing apart because of the language barrier Latin versus Greek, as well as the theological differences, not to mention that the one thing that the Pope in the West and the Patriarch in the East agreed on was that it would have been much better if there was just one of them. So by the time Vladimir enters the stage and decides that it's time for Rus to join the monotheism club, the relationship is pretty close to an official breakup. The way the primary chronicle is telling the legend of how Vladimir was choosing religion is a bit like he's Goldilocks at a buffet. First, it tells us of Muslims who come and say to him, Though you are a wise and prudent prince, you have no religion. Adopt our faith. Vladimir inquired what was the nature of their religion. They replied that they believed in God and that Muhammad instructed them to practice circumcision, to eat no pork, to drink no wine, and, after death, promised them complete fulfillment of their carnal desires. Muhammad, they asserted, will give each of us 70 fair women. Vladimir listened to them, for he was fond of women and indulgence, regarding which he heard with pleasure. But circumcision and abstinence from pork and wine were disagreeable to him. Drinking, said he, is the joy of the Rus. We cannot exist without that pleasure. A quote to this day beloved by many who need something to blame their drinking problem on. He then has a visit from the Germans representing the Pope, who tempt him with some fasting, but Vladimir basically replies that they had their chance previously, and if his ancestors didn't like them, neither did he. Then, Jewish Khazars decide to join the party, but when Vladimir learns that they were kicked out of their own homeland, he replied, How can you hope to teach others while you yourselves are cast out and scattered abroad by the hand of God? If God loved you and your faith, you would not be thus dispersed in foreign lands. Rude. Then the Greeks sent to Vladimir a scholar, who basically kicks the meeting off by talking smack about everybody who came before. He calls Muslims vile and cursed, says that Romans got it all wrong, and that the Jews had crucified Jesus, and that the Greeks are basically the best, and that the service is really pretty. Sick, replied Vladimir. Actual quote. And he baptized the Rus. The end. As for the real life, sources point to Vladimir's baptism to have less to do with drinking and more to do with marriage and to one of the most powerful families in the world. Even if those legendary visits from other faiths did take place, there could be no other outcome. Rus had always looked at Byzantine as the main source of wealth and power and culture, even if they mostly preferred to pillage all of the above. But it seems like in 988, Vladimir tried something else. He helped the Constantinople emperor put down a rebellion and while in the neighborhood in Crimea, to be precise, he got baptized and asked for the hand of the Byzantine princess, Anna, which he was granted, most likely in exchange for his military services. The exact order of these events is argued, but either way, Vladimir returns to Kiev and begins the process of mass conversion. The pagan idols he erected are destroyed, and people from nobility to the commoners are converted into Greek Orthodox Church. In Kiev, process goes somewhat smoothly, mostly due to some exposure in the past. While further north, such as Novgorod, the reform met a lot of resistance. In many parts of Kiev and Rus, paganism lasted for centuries after. Even today, you can find a lot of paganist beliefs and celebrations integrated within Russian faith traditions and folklore. Maslenitsa is a great example, celebrated in the end of winter in the week before the Great Lent. On the one hand, it's a religious holiday, on the other hand, it's basically Russian Mardi Gras, a wildly celebrated sun carnival with a bunch of pagan symbolism, pancakes, and the burning of a giant straw doll. You just don't get more pagan than that. Nevertheless, Vladimir was very successful with this reform and many other positive, yet often forced, changes. He pretty much laid the foundation for education among the Rus by basically taking kids away and forcing them to learn to read. Vladimir also led a lot of very successful military campaigns expanding his state and started the Kievan coin production with his portrait on him, of course. Vladimir's legacy is rich and complicated. He definitely wasn't a saint by any moral measure. Although after his conversion, he's told to have freed his army of sex slaves and actually did a lot of charitable work and behaved rather Christianly. As a ruler, he consolidated and centralized power, married into imperial Byzantine family, expanded his lands, and achieved peace with nearly all of his neighbors. And of course, almost single-handedly, converted all of Rus into a new religion. What he couldn't have known, of course, is that in 1054, 
Byzantine will completely and officially break up with its Western BFF. And in 1456, Constantinople will fall and become the center of the new Muslim Empire the Ottoman state. As a result, future Russian Empire will forever stay its own unique brand of Christian. It will have its own patriarch and the church will forever be separated from the one presiding over all of Europe. This independence served Russia on many occasions, but also isolated it. In a way, same can be said of Vladimir. At least one of his wives tried to kill him and his sons rebelled against him. After imprisoning one son, Vladimir died in 1015, trying to gather troops against the other son. And that's it for this one. In the next episode, reign of Yaroslav the Wise and Rus marrying its way through all of royal Europe in the best male bride tradition. See you then.